so this was supposed to be a short video to help me recharge after Battle Network 5 fried my brain and gave me severe writer's block. There's only so many ways I can still describe these internet shenanigans after over five hours of reviews and dozens of hours of streams. I was just completely out of ideas and I needed a break. However, I'm completely incapable of making a short, easy video, it would seem. This episode kept getting longer and I kept adding more observations and now we're doing this. Oh boy, here we go. Even when I'm not talking about Mega Man on Game Boy Advance, I'm talking about Mega Man on Game Boy Advance. Launched on the GBA April 26, 2002, Mega Man Zero begins the third era of the main Mega Man timeline, following directly after Mega Man X and preceding Mega Man ZX. This subseries re-centered its focus from Mega Man X onto the fan-favorite Maverick Hunter Zero, which makes a lot of sense, seeing as the X games had become infinitely more interested in him anyway. Might as well cut the bullshit and just make him the main character, right? This gives the Zero series the distinction of being the only Mega Man subseries where a character named Mega Man is never playable. I assume the Mega Man prefix was kept because selling a game simply called Zero would have been a marketing nightmare. The game is a fast-paced 2D action platformer, heavy on run and gun and hack and slash combat, which is super smart considering it was on a handheld with a tiny screen and only four buttons. Now, the boys and girls in blue and gold were busy with continuing the X series, Sans and Afune at the time, and with the newly birthed money printing machine that you might possibly have heard of. This meant Capcom's Mega Man making capabilities were temporarily occupied, forcing them to find an outside studio to give them a hand. Welcome to the stage, Inti Creates, a studio you may know for making Mega Man 9 and 10, getting booted off Bloodstained for making whatever the fuck this was, and providing us definitive proof that KG Inafune is a hack fraud. This made sense at the time, as Inti Creates is mostly former Capcom staff, so they're used to working on Mega Man anyway. So Inti Creates started making the Mega Man Zero games, and never actually stopped making Mega Man Zero games, they just call them something else now. While performing commercially about as well as you would expect, critically the Zero games are all very well received, and a lot of Mega Man fans consider it their favorite subseries. I've barely touched them prior to this video, so I'm going in with no nostalgia and no knowledge of any of the game's inner workings. Given how infamously difficult these games can be, we'll see how that all works out for me. Okay, here we go. First real playthrough of Mega Man Zero. I see a bunch of new characters. Uh, the art style's completely different. Uh, there's nobody I recognize. Oh, oh wait, I think I've seen that fairy before. Hey, listen. Oh, it's Zero. He looks completely different. Also slightly pink for some reason. Well, I guess this game must take place in the future. I'm sure they'll explain what happened to him and why he has this new armor. Oh, there's a burning super death sword. All right, so we're gonna join these resistance guys, and it's time for some good old-fashioned Maverick hunting. Let's try the first level. It's only the intro mission, though, so I'm not expecting anything crazy. That was a hell of an introduction. That's probably just a fluke. Let's head for the next mission. This level kicked my ass! I'll just give up for now and try a different one. I can always come back later. <laughs> So, it turns out that missions disappear when you give up on them. I've pressed give up on three missions now, thinking I could just back up and explore the levels, looking for power-ups and learning the game, and then come back later. You know, like a Mega Man game. Why give me the option to tackle multiple missions from the start then? Hell, why doesn't it just reload the save automatically? Why the fuck does the give up option even exist? No one would ever want to press that once they know it deletes the goddamn levels. Maybe I just need some power-ups. I've been picking up these cyber elf things. They sound like they might be power-ups. Well, let's see. Oh, you can't use them right away. You have to feed them crystals first. All right. That's fine. I've been picking up a whole bunch of them. So is this game trolling? <sighs> some, some, some grind this fucking bullshit grinding in a platform. Are you going to be kidding me? This fucking 
Spent 20 minutes grinding energy crystals to get a health upgrade. J just, a, just a single one of multiple health upgrades. Give the hunger little bastard a thousand crystals, and by the magic of Charles Darwin, it's evolved. Hold on. Why can't I equip it yet? Son of a whore. This was the precise moment I completely abandoned my original blind run. I'd barely completed any missions, I had no upgrades or weapons, th there's no way I can finish the game in this state. It's clear I had no idea what the red hell I'm supposed to do. Fuck this, I'm turning on the checkpoints. Okay, well we had our fun, let's try and take a more organized and thoughtful approach this time. There's gonna be some cheating here with the story, because despite having interesting lore, the first Mega Man Zero game is very light on exposition, and most of its background and world building is hidden in instruction manuals, guidebooks, and audio dramas. This is a consistent problem with Mega Man in general, come to think of it. But this outside info is still very important to your understanding and enjoyment of the story. And you know me, I talk about lore a lot. So let's lore it up. At an unspecified point after the end of the X series, Zero chooses to seal himself away, feeling the Maverick virus that's always been within him is too dangerous to leave unchecked, lest we end up with another Zero Nightmare situation. This moment is viewable at the end of Mega Man X6, which was the last Mega Man game in development around when Zero was released. But since X7 and X8 exist, this moment is simply presumed to take place after those games, kinda like a flash forward. While he's sleeping, researchers are able to use the data within Zero to forge a perfect cure for the Sigma virus. Using this vaccine, X is able to defeat Sigma once and for all. But the world of the Mega Man series is a cruel one, stuck in an endless cycle of war and destruction. A period of four years known as the Elf Wars would begin shortly after the Maverick Hunter's victory. Without spoiling future titles, a mad scientist used strength stolen from Zero's body in his comatose state to attempt world domination, eliminating 60% of all humanity and 90% of all reploids in the process. Zero was awoken to assist X in this crisis, and together the two were able to crush the evil scientist's ambitions. But the damage had already been done. Once again forced to witness another mass extinction event caused by his power, a remorseful Zero decides the only way to prevent more senseless death is to permanently lock himself away. ゼロ。何言ってるんだ Wow, that might be the most intense character interaction in the entire X series, and it's in a Japan only audio drama. Good. In fact, everything I just told you is entirely external information. The game itself never directly explains any of this. The game just kinda...
After having watched her entire team mowed down by an army of mechanoloids, the only survivor, a young scientist named Ciel, is cornered with no hope of escaping. Ciel's fairy-like companion, Passy, offers to give up her life force to repair Zero so that he can protect her. Ciel is torn, but ultimately agrees with her decision. Oh my god, so fucking cool! I guess we're escorting CL out of here now. Wake up after a hundred years and already back to work. As you can no doubt see with your magical light refracting jelly lumps, Zero on a fundamental level is very close to its older brother, Mega Man X. You can shoot your buster, charge your shot, quickly dash forward at the press of a button, and cling to walls, which allows you to repeatedly wall jump for tricky platforming and boss patterns. Straight to the point, Zero's controls in this game are laser accurate, and arguably the best controls in any Mega Man game, period. His speed is perfect, he doesn't carry any unwieldy momentum, and he smoothly transitions between walking, dashing, jumping, and attacking, with no weird delay present in games like Mega Man X4. These nice-ass controls carry us through this small tutorial stage. Zero saves CL from the collapsing building, and the pair make their way to the exit transporter. Oh, come on, CL, don't be that kind of character. This ain't Zero's first giant robot rodeo, so time to dodge some telegraphed attacks and unload on its head. God damn, this is taking forever. Oh, that's much better. Thanks, 3D printer fairy. あなたがあの伝説のゼロなのね。ゼロ。俺の名前か。思い出せ。無理やり起こしてしまって。ごめんなさい。お願い。あなたの力を借りたいの。<laughs> Back at the Resistance base, the young woman is thrilled to have the legendary Zero on their side. Zero has no idea who the fuck she's talking about. The Red Hero's extended stasis has scrambled his memory, to the point he no longer even remembers his name. This is certainly... A narrative decision. That's all I have to say about it at the moment. Memories are no. Zero still feels a compulsion to help people in need. And oh boy are the resistance people in need. Resources are scarce, land is barren, and the nearly extinct humans and reploids fight to survive. In Zero's absence, a large city dubbed Neo Arcadia has risen to be the controlling force in the ravaged world. The only populated city remaining on Earth, Neo Arcadia was created as a peaceful metropolis where humans and reploids lived as equals. However, something changed a few years ago when a severe energy shortage began to emerge. Arcadia's utopian coexistence shifted back towards the days of Mega Man and Mega Man X, where robots worked as disposable second-class citizens and servants to humans. Remember, reploids have true free will, so this is basically slavery. This archaic pecking order is enforced by an all-powerful, overprotective leader, who dubs any reploids deemed a threat to humans as mavericks and has them destroyed. This is why CL and the other Resistance members live underground in hiding, as they have been judged as mavericks by the government. I mean, CL is a human, but she's still a maverick, I guess. Just in the more traditional sense of the word. In spite of their vicious human-first policy, the leader of Neo Arcadia is a reploid himself. A reploid named X. 
That name jogs something inside Zero's thoughts, but he doesn't dwell on it for very long. Bottom line, Ciel and the Resistance need Zero's help with a variety of tasks, from recon, to saving lost soldiers, to defending their base from X's murder squads. Before we dive into the standard level select though, there's a single mission that requires our immediate attention. Destroying the Disposal Center, where Reploids are carted off to be, uh, retired. Not a ton to dig into as far as the stage itself is concerned. The layout is simple, and most enemies here die in one slash. That is an incredibly satisfying animation. It's a nice touch that most every goon, even bosses, have different death animations for being killed by a melee weapon or the buster. And since we're talking about our weapons, let's talk about my favorite gameplay addition. Zero's ability to ready two weapons simultaneously. Possessing both a buster and the Z-Saber means no longer narrowing your range options instead of choosing either X or Zero. No, the Z-Buster does not count. You can use your secondary weapon easily by pressing the R button instead of B, so you can switch up your strategies on the fly to fit whatever enemy or situation you find yourself up against. Aztec Falcon as a first boss is a little much, I gotta be real with you. He primarily attacks with a huge metal claw that blocks projectiles while firing bolts of electricity. That alone isn't that bad. The noob killer aspect of this boss is the time limit. The Reploids underneath the Crusher will be killed if we wait too long, and in my experience, Aztec Falcon often gets stuck in his laser loop here, which doesn't really leave an opening to attack. But it reminds me to bring something up. Something I came to realize about this game during my hours spent with it. Zero does so little damage at the start of the game that pea shooting bosses until they die from the other side of the screen is a hilariously gimped option. But even if you did more damage, it doesn't really matter because your health is so pitifully low you likely won't survive long enough to kill bosses like that anyway. The thing I came to learn that helped me get better at the game is this. If you take the initiative and instead rush into the danger, you'll end up better for it in most cases. Walk right up to them and slice their kneecaps. The sword is so much stronger than the buster that it's insane. Captain Falcon gets roasted and the plant is shut down. Before leaving, Zero finds a thunder chip among the scrap and takes it to augment his weapons. In a controversial change that I'm not entirely fond of, rival Reploids no longer give a signature copy ability when defeated. Instead, they give you jack shit. Copy abilities are replaced by three elemental chips that are found after three of the levels, and they don't give you alternate weapons. They just change your charge shot to deal damage of that element. There's no experimenting or testing to be done with these outside of guessing which one the boss is weak to. They feel like the beginning of an idea, included to keep Mega Man's rock-paper-scissors dynamic in place for the sake of tradition. Insert segue about traditions here. Oh, fuck, I wasn't supposed to read that part. When we return to base, we're given a handful of missions to choose from. They all have innocuous names and no images or boss info to base your decision on, so you're pretty much going in blind. The lack of a stage preview, lack of copy abilities, and the completely idiotic give up option that I mentioned before kind of negates the purpose of a level select, which to me is to mess around and try different stage orders to find the one that's right for you and to increase replay value. This game could be 100% linear and wouldn't really lose anything. Hell, I might have preferred that. Let's just head down the list in order for the time being. Desert area is up first. Things are flat and straightforward, as deserts are wont to be. These annoying dragon bros pop out of the ground randomly, and the floor is covered in bear traps for some reason, but there really isn't anything worth mentioning. Until we get to the boss. Anubis Necromancis is the encounter that made me quit when I first tried Mega Man Zero all those years ago. The violent Egyptian doggo floats above the arena, using his staff to protect himself, only dropping his guard to throw said staff at you. If you try to bust or kill him, you'll be waiting here forever, alongside the people who still think we're getting Legends 3. Because blocking aside, it does crap to him damage-wise. The best way to damage Anubis is to just barely edge him with your saber. Be an adult and control 
control yourself. This can be tough, what with the sword's limited range. Adding on to that are the spike pillars he pulls out of the ground when you do too much damage to him, and the waves of zombies he calls from the ground, which wouldn't be the worst things to deal with, but they can take more punishment than you'd expect, and can grab you, even out of invincibility frames. So that's kind of an inconvenience, to put it lightly. This guy shows off a personal issue I have about the bosses in Mega Man Zero. It's not that they're particularly crushing on the challenging front, it's that the punishment for losing to them is so severe. On your first playthrough, you just do not have the health or lives to mess around and learn a boss's pattern and tells. The game is so fast-paced, and Zero dies so quickly that it might take you a few tries to get a read on your opponent. Damnedest thing about that. You don't get a few tries. Lives do not replenish when returning to the base after a mission, and they don't come back when loading a save. So even if you find a 1-up or 2 in the later levels, you're still likely only going to get 2 or 3 chances at a stage tops. This is why I'm using the Checkpoint Assist feature from the Zero ZX collection, which adds these green pods to the game that work more or less like save states. Without these, I likely wouldn't have even bothered to finish the game, because replaying every stage a million times would have bored me into a comatose state, and I would have probably trashed the video. Oh hey, I beat the magical rod dog! Now I have to slowly escort the wounded survivor back to the base. Keep in mind, this game is on a GBA, so it's screen crunch central. Be prepared for enemies and projectiles to fly in from just off camera and hit this hobbling moron. Next assignment. Return to the lab where Zero was locked away, because there's some nonsense going on there. We were here just a few minutes ago, so you should still have most of the place memorized. But a ton of new anti-personnel devices have been haphazardly tossed around the halls. I'm lucky as hell that I noticed an important property of these Electro Ball security doodads. I'm sure a million people already know this, but these spheres are indestructible. Which doesn't sound like a helpful thing to notice, but... Allow me to explain. Even though these spheres are indestructible, they still count as attacking an enemy when hit. This means you can use them to grind out a pointlessly convoluted mechanic that I've yet to mention. Weapons in Mega Man Zero have a star level that represents Zero's proficiency. The level is raised by simply dealing damage with said weapons. Crucially though, if you do not purposefully grind these stars, you won't even be able to sniff the max star level. It requires so many hits, and so much time. And without said star levels, you can't even charge your shot all the way, or swing the saber more than once. I haven't even seen people who love this game defend the mastery system. It's a great idea for an upgrade method. The sucky part is that it asks you to set aside several years of your life to take advantage of it. Awaiting us in zero ceiling chamber is a round elephant reploid called the Maha Ganesharith. Oh, duh. All these new reploids are named after gods and mythological creatures, it would seem. According to supplemental material, this new series of robots are called Mudos Reploids, and were created as protectors of humanity, hence their godlike inspiration. This one's really easy, though. The only attack worth watching for is when he spin dashes. As he passes by, he fires out mines behind him, and if you jump at the wrong time, you'll be right above him as the mine shoots up. It's fine when you know to watch for it, but the first time, it's basically a free hit on you. Back at the ranch, Zero presents CL with some damaged weapon data he recovered, and she points him towards Servo, the reploid who handles such things for the resistance. Shoot, yeah, there's a hub in this game. It's kind of unremarkable. There's a collectible or two, but there's only like five NPCs and a bunch of empty rooms. Anyway, the purpose of Servo is to toss us together new weapons, the two available being the Triple Rod and the Shield Boomerang. The Triple Rod is a spear that can be thrust in any direction, which would be great if the Z-Saber didn't have a larger hitbox and could spin around Zero's entire body when upgraded. The Triple Rod itself can be upgraded for longer range, but if you think I'm standing 
standing in front of those shocky balls for another 10 minutes, you really underestimate my hatred for time-wasty bullcrap. Don't worry though, this weapon does have one situation where it's incredibly good, which redeems it in my eyes. Can't say the same for the shield boomerang. The shield boomerang probably means something to somebody somewhere, but fuck me, this thing is pointless. Like the name implies, you can hold it in front of Zero's body to deflect oncoming bullets. Just bullets. Physical attacks don't count, and anything other than the basic bitch pea shooter flies right through. Also known as 80% of all the attacks in the game. You can throw the shield after charging it, but it takes the same amount of time, if not longer, than the buster to rev up. I don't know, it wouldn't be a bad addition if it didn't take up one of your weapon slots. The GBA only has four buttons, but if you could theoretically pull it out whenever with a separate button, I would have probably gotten some use out of it. And no, shield canceling doesn't count. That's a glitch. Next on the agenda is securing a nearby energy plant. You can leap across the rooftops to sneak in through a vent and get a few extra items. One of the few times I actually felt rewarded for exploring. Then you come across some of X's dastardly screen crunch augmented moving platforms, where you can barely see what's below you. You have to very carefully tippy tap wall jumps on these little ledges to maybe see the moving platforms below you. A big ol' Hydra Mechanoloid is protecting the plant, and this was almost a really cool boss fight. It has four different sets of heads that it cycles through, and each has a different attack. The letdown for me is that all of these attacks are dealt with the exact same way, by just dashing underneath the opposite head. It's not a bad encounter, in fact I think it would have been perfect as the first boss instead of Aztec Fuckhead. Zero warps back to base and didn't even let me finish my sentence. A giant tank mechanoloid is barreling towards the resistance space, and Zero runs out to stop it. I'm sure you're meant to employ some manner of strategy here, but even with no health upgrades or sub-tanks, I just charged at it over and over again with the Z-Saber and beat it no problem. See, this is more of that rush into danger thing I was talking about. We're about halfway done now, so I decided I should finally look at the third section of the pause menu. Cyber Elves lore-wise are some of the most fucked in the head stuff the Mega Man series has ever come up with. They are completely sentient computer programs capable of thoughts and emotions that are used to augment a Reploid's abilities. Oh, that's cute. They're like their little adorable familiar sidekick. How do they power up Reploids again? Why would you design them like this? I can't find any in-universe reason as to why the Cyber Elves have to be living things. It makes it super fucked up when you use their powers because it kills them. Why not just have nondescript balls of light with basic AI, like a Roomba or something? Why do they have to have feelings? Jesus. Mental scarring aside, you pick up Cyber Elves throughout the stages, either inside enemies or trapped in containers inside hidden areas. Most of them do simplistic one-use abilities, like restore some HP or give you a shield, but some of them offer permanent upgrades, like reduce knockback or, most importantly, increasing Zero's max health. Zero heads out to investigate what can barely still be considered a bridge at this point, and falls a whole bunch. Sage Harpuja... Harpuja? Harpuja? That's his name. Sure. Harp here is one of X's four guardians, special reploids disturbingly loyal to X, made from the DNA of the Blue Man himself. Simply put, they're the big boy bosses that run the show. They're given a little more development and character than the Mudos reploids, so expect them to be important going forward. Now then, Harp is a sharp jump in power from the last few reploids and the boss I was stuck at the longest. 
he has three health bars rather than two, and can kill zero in just three or four hits. The Hurricane here swoops around the stage, firing off shockwaves with his blades. When you smack him with a strong enough attack, Harp will be grounded, where he'll send out more slashes, or he'll summon a small drone that's just... Oh boy, it's the worst. If you accidentally knock him down when he's too close to you, well, now you're cornered. Die. Without the ice chip, this guy is a hundred times more difficult. I know I'm a broken record, but Zero just doesn't have any durability. And Harp has three full-size health bars. Remember that Zero also has to play the stage first, so it's not even certain you'll enter the fight with full HP. His pattern isn't hard to wrap your head around. After a few tries, it's not unfair or anything. But the fight really drags on without his weakness, and the likelihood of you making a small mistake and dying in all that time is high. And the nonsensical retry system System means you'll be playing the bridge over and over and over. Harp doesn't get blown up in a beautiful flash of pixelated fire. Rather, he expresses surprise at Zero's power and swears vengeance before disappearing. Back at the Resistance base, CL asks Zero to cut down a large army amassing out in the desert, and help the soldiers stationed there. It's the exact same level as before, but with X's soldiers as moves this time. These basic robots all take a single sword swing to kill, so this whole stage is smooth. Double Deuces in Red is fighting Fefnir, the second of the four Guardians. Fefnir is a much more beginner-friendly boss than Harp. The field has plenty of space to move around, and thus his attacks are easier to avoid. It helps that Fefnir spends his fight slamming around like a big idiot and firing slow fireballs all Dracula-like. As long as you stay away so as not to get grabbed, you'll be a-okay. Okay, we're getting closer to the end, and who knows when the difficulty will spike up again. I'm playing through all these missions with two dozen unused upgrades sitting in my inventory, and it's starting to bug me something fierce. I wanted to avoid this, but I need to grind out those stupid crystals for the Cyber Elf. A neat attempt at interconnectivity is made in Mega Man Zero. The stages are all linked via the Resistance HQ hub and can be revisited by just walking over to them. This means we can go back to the energy plant and hope they've been making use of the place after we captured it. There's tons of energy crystals here, but it only results in about 500 or so energy. Not even half the amount we need for this single elf. It's 3,000 in case you forgot. So I went to the godforsaken desert and did this for 20 minutes, for one of a dozen upgrades. This is an indefensibly bad gameplay mechanic. It's beautiful. New mission. Back to the desert. Fuck! Halfway into the same level we already played twice, Zero comes across a deep pit that links to a cave system. CL calls to tell him this is the entrance to a hidden Neo-Arcadian base, where a squad of Resistance members are being held prisoner. The interior of the hangar contains a series of jail cells, with Zero having to go around and find the seven soldiers taken hostage while sneaking past the guards. At least you're supposed to. In reality, the screen is far too small and zoomed in for any actual stealth to take place, and just running around from cell to cell as fast as you can is a perfectly viable strategy. After saving everyone, Zero meets the warden of the prison, Blizzak Stagroth. You know, the ex-Mavericks had stupid names sometimes, but these don't even come off as real words. He shoots ice. I never have anything to say about ice bosses on this channel. The fire chip makes short work of him.
This game's difficulty curve is an EKG machine. Next mission! Back to the factory to... Okay, that caught me off guard. I guess we're having our boss fight before the stage this time. Kagebushi no Jutsu over there is Hidden Phantom, a third guardian, as one would presume. He only has two main attacks, creating substitution clones of himself and making you strike the real one, or throwing his big ass shuriken around the room and riding on it. I almost beat him on my first panicked attempt, but had no problems the second time. Damn, this health increase has made this an entirely different game, and that's only a single upgrade. Of course, Phantom is a sore loser and set explosives throughout the energy plant, activating their timer before... Cue us playing the same stage we've already played with next to no changes, only now we have to hit the eight bombs. Yep, this part with the steel bars still sucks. Our last mission for the Resistance is to go back to the desert for a fourth time and go back to the underground facility. God, the cartridge limitations are killing this game. The hangar below the prison is now thawed out. I love swimming. Let's jump right in. Okay, let's be more careful. There's these subs bobbing above us. It looks like we can get onto them. If I didn't have checkpoint assist on, I'd have to reload my save right now. We climb up to a secret room behind the jail cells and destroy a large supercomputer, which does... something- CL said what it did, I, w I wasn't paying attention, I'm sorry. The final guardian, Fairy Leviathan, is a water, but also ice-themed mermaid person, who should probably be immune to fire, but god does it fuck her up. Leviathan flies around and drops ice crystals, and... shoots ice crystals. Is every ice boss in every Mega Man game underwhelming? She noticed that Zero isn't trying to actually kill her, and she also becomes obsessed with refighting Zero. I'm coming to the realization that all these guardians are just Goro Majima. Finally. Our entire itinerary is now cleared. Time to take a break for a minute. I should have stayed asleep. Beyond fed up with Zero screwing over all their plans, Neo Arcadia launches an all-out assault on the Resistance. Fearing for their safety, CL orders everyone to evacuate. Everyone except... CL herself, who feels responsible for what's happening. Zero asks her what she could have to do with X and his army, and CL admits that she's the one who allowed Neo Arcadia to devolve into its current dictatory state, as she resurrected X in the first place. Zero asks for clarification, with CL responding that Zero was simply reactivated from his original body, while X... Well, that's gonna have to wait till later. Zero saves the remaining Resistance members from the ambush and heads to energy storage, where the leader of the attack, this Sun Wukong-looking fella named Hanu Machine, is located. Him and Zero have a nice talk over a bowl of screen crunch, and he's swiftly taken out. Seriously, you don't even have to fight him on screen. Just shooting off blindly seems to work, unlike most bosses where the bullets disappear after leaving the screen. As what remains of the Resistance decide what to do next, that rainbow sparkle ball from the intro shows up. It tells the crew that it's activated the trance server in Neo Arcadia and sends us off to eliminate its copy. You should have pieced together what's going on here by now. Zero arrives in the ruins on the outskirts of the city. Think of the Neo Arcadia area like the Wily Palace or Sigma stages. Though the spike in difficulty isn't as severe as you'd expect, in fact, this stage is rather easy, barring this one section with the accursed disappearing blocks. We were so close to this game not even having them, and they have to go balls it up at the last minute. Going room to room, destroying a bunch of mini-bosses, we eventually end up against...
Of course this game has one. I'm gonna guess it's called the Rainbow Devil. Hey, what do you know? It would look as though my apprehension was misplaced. The Rainbow Devil only has two or three moves, and they're all a piece of cake to avoid by wall jumping over and over. Not that I'm complaining. It's not like I wanted this game's rendition of a terribly difficult devil boss. Out of nowhere, CL is waiting in the next room for us. What she was trying to say earlier is too important to wait. She has to tell Zero now. CL builds up the nerve to finally come out and say that she created the leader of Neo Arcadia. Okay, that brings up some questions. Lore dump time! The X that leads the government isn't the real X, the one created by Dr. Light, but a copy built by CL to replace the real X and guide the world towards peace. A few years prior to this game, the real X mysteriously disappeared and presumably died. So to prevent mass panic and keep Neo Arcadia in line, Copy X was created as a perfect clone of the original to keep things in working order. Problems began to arise over time. Time, however, as Copy X viewed protection of humans as his utmost priority over all else, even basic morality, CL started forming the resistance to put a stop to her creation, and that multicolored cyber elf appeared to assist her, giving CL instructions on where to find Zero. Which pretty much brings us up to speed with where we are now. Hearing all this, Zero chooses to forgive CL, knowing that she only did what she thought was right, and assuring her that he'll deal with the rest of this mess. I don't know if good intentions negates inventing Robo-Hitler, but we're gonna roll with it for now. It's boss rush time, everybody! Oh yes, boss rush time. That magical time of year when all of the robots you've blown up miraculously reappear in conveniently partitioned rooms instead of bum-rushing you all simultaneously. You might think that after all the hemming and hawing I've done, this is gonna be a bitch and a half. You'd be wrong! Almost every boss in this game has Spark Mandrill Syndrome. The only reason these bosses are tough to deal with when you first battle them is because you might not have the chip they're vulnerable to. This is likely why I found the last few bosses much easier than the first few. I mean, it doesn't help that even finding which missions drop elemental chips is complete guesswork, because there's no way to tell on your first playthrough which missions have the chips to get. About this point, it became clear to me. Mega Man Zero is the Dark Souls of run and gun platformer. Hey, 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 I see you. I see you clicking the back button. Slow your fucking roll and please listen, okay? This might be a controversial take. Dark Souls difficulty has little to do with execution or raw skill. It's mostly memorization of patterns and tells, and once you've reached a level of understanding about how those aspects function, the game becomes far, far easier. Mega Man Zero is the same way. It's a noob killer, and one of the least beginner-friendly games I've ever played. But it's not significantly harder than most other Mega Man games, not in pure design terms, anyway. Screen crunch stops being a problem when you've already died to the traps and know their location, and bosses stop being a problem once you find their exploitable weakness. You know, like all Mega Man games. Zero gives the feeling of being a brutal game because of its atrocious retry and grinding systems that get in the way of a new player getting to that point where they've learned the game. If you don't want to kill enemies over and over again for hours, you won't have access to all of Zero's basic attacks. You won't be getting any extra lives, you won't be getting any health ups or sub tanks, and you won't be getting any passive upgrades. I'd imagine any Mega Man X game would be insanely difficult with no upgrades. So Zero isn't unique in that regard. The thing is Mega Man Zero just forces that playstyle onto most players, rather than it being sort of an optional challenge run. The moral of the story is, if you've never gotten into Mega Mega Man Zero because you found it too punishing, buy the ZX collection and turn on the save assist if you get stuck, which gives you infinite lives and more frequent checkpoints. The grinding for weapons and energy crystals is still there, but at least you can freely experiment with boss strategies and stage layouts without losing everything and constantly having to reset. Oh, there's like a video game or something going on in the background behind all my nagging. Oh. We should check that out. We mow down all the Reploids once more, and even the four Guardians. Things are looking normal until you get to Hidden Phantom. Unlike his three counterparts, Phantom does not teleport out of the room when defeated a second time.
I don't know why they decided he had to be the only one to permanently die, but rip in the chat for Ninja Gaiden. You clingy deviant art OCs, take a hike already! Kabiak starts off the fight by equipping his ultimate armor, which gives him access to the Nova Strike, and also the ability to fly, because screw you. He then cycles through different copy abilities, mirroring the real X, though his behavior is much the same regardless of the ability equipped, it just changes his charge shot. This needs the final boss, and words are failing me. The screen crunch is still a thorn in my side, leaving Kabiak off screen for half the battle, but working around that, he's nothing special.君は僕の心臓通り愉快な人だね。君のような人と楽しい時間を過ごせて本当に良かったよ。弱いな。なんだと？オリジナルの X そんなに弱かったのか。Can I have the floor back, please? Armed Phenomenon Copy X is an angel-shaped fury generating machine. The arena has been reduced to a tiny platform with moving spike pillars on either side. X can only be hit on his very small head, and hey, thanks for including the boss gimmick I hate the fucking most Inti creates. Copy X has three attacks, and they all have their own unique flavor of nope. He starts out with a barrage of rings that lock you in place. Yes, these will hit you while you're in the air or while wall sliding. If they hit you while you're doing either of those things, you will die. Then there's a spread shot of energy beams that I'm sure you can avoid somehow. I was just real shit at it. The last attack is, oh god, are you joking? This Final Fantasy reject tears a laser across the ground, causing it to erupt in flames. If you can get to the side pillars, you'll be fine. If you're on the platform, you'll get humbled real quick. Trying to fight Copy X the obvious way, jumping around between the floor and walls, chipping away with your buster, or trying to swing at his head without taking touch damage, yes, screw all that. Now time to shine. The Triple Spear has at last found a place to call home. I'm so proud of it. I later learned that this boss can be cheesed even harder by using charged saber swings and just taking the touch damage from X. Because, for whatever reason, I, I don't know if it's a mistake, I don't know why the game is designed like this, touching him only deals one pip of damage and gives you enough invincibility frames to just keep going back and forth and doing the same thing. Yes, 
実連に知ってるいいやマニアかThe spirit of X confides in Zero, admitting that he's fought for so long that he can't even find it in himself to keep going. His spirit is exhausted and desperately needs to rest. Hell, Zero got to sleep for a hundred years. X deserves a break too, right? Zero pulls himself to his feet, and facing countless mavericks in the middle of the endless desert, he assures X that he'll carry on the fight for peace in his stead. Okay, right off the bat, this story was too interesting and had way too much potential to be wasted on a limited space GBA cart. 12 words at a time, featureless black square text boxes with no voices, in between the same five stages replayed over and over, isn't exactly an enthralling method of plot delivery. Not to mention, as previously stated, most of the important details are exclusive to supplemental materials. That's not to say it's terrible or anything, Inti Creates absolutely did the best they could given the time and the hardware. That's not to say I 100% agree with every aspect of the story, uh, and mostly character stuff. Let's start with Zero himself. I'm sure this is going to be a hot take, but Zero having amnesia is the worst, most unnecessary part of the narrative. Seeing him stand silently while other characters pour their heart out to him, like he's busy thinking about what he's going to have for dinner tonight, got very distracting as the game went on. Zero is the only character we as the player know going into this story, and we don't get his opinions or insights on anything that's happening, because thanks to his memory loss, this character isn't really Zero until the final area. He's just a blank slate. Then you got Copy X, and he is a clone character in a fictional story, all right? They always kind of hit the same beats, don't they? Inferiority complex and all that. I don't dislike him, but he doesn't really do anything for me. His only purpose to exist narratively is to serve as a contrast to X and to enhance X's character retroactively. If we look at him through that lens, He's actually rather intriguing. X was designed to learn and grow like a human, beginning his life as a wide-eyed, clueless weakling, barely a bottom-class maverick hunter, just trying to do what Dr. Light taught him to stand for justice. X was a pacifist, he was afraid of fighting in war. If you've played the X games, he never shuts up about it. But it's because he had the strength to act beyond those feelings that he became a hero. Copy X didn't experience any of that. He was brought into existence as a supremely powerful being, worshipped by the world as a savior. He was naive and self-centered, nothing like the real X. But, if we're mentioning Copy X, then I have to address that developer comment. Let's talk about the thing all the Zero fans are waiting for me to talk about. It's their favorite piece of trivia to share. Copy X wasn't initially planned to be the main antagonist. It was supposed to be the real X. This ties well with the X series itself, as it's been set up since X4 that X would have become a maverick at some point, but you probably didn't notice it because people are too busy laughing at Zero's story. Specifically, X says this. Zero. <laughs> Zero. 
Mech 7 would later add even more fuel to this fire via Zero's ending, where he experiences a nightmare of an evil X attacking him. You get the idea. The villain being the true X was clearly the original intention. The rumor is this was changed barely a month before the game launched, and all the additional backstory with CL was tossed in to make sense of the whole thing. Even if everyone doesn't agree with the reasoning, it makes perfect sense. Players were going to be attached to X after so many games, and the X series was going to keep moving forward. Turning the kind-hearted protagonist into a genocidal lunatic, then killing him, would have left a bad first impression for this new subseries. So, yeah, they didn't do that. Before moving on from the story, I guess I should talk about CL now, too? She's the only other main character, and she's gonna be here for the long haul. CL is a bioengineered human with advanced mental capabilities, a situation that became more common as the world needed more scientists to advance the field of robotics. This is how she was able to create CopyX despite only being around 12 at the time. She sometimes vaguely mentions she's trying to fix the energy crisis, but that topic is cut short for a million lines about how she's worried about Zero. Holy insufferable repetition does she worry about Zero. It feels like there's supposed to be some sort of bond forming between them, but when she only talks to him to deliver orders and exposition, and Zero doesn't fucking say anything, it comes off very forced when the game insists that these two have any sort of relationship outside of work friends. No, don't worry, I had loads of people insist to me on my community page that she's much more interesting in future titles, and I'll take their word on that for the time being. For reference, I played the game three times. Once was my initial playthrough, which was a complete disaster. My second playthrough, which is primarily what I've shown off throughout the video, where I beat the game using the checkpoint assist. And a third, mostly unrecorded, casual playthrough of the Japanese version, where I beat the game without the checkpoint assist, or any upgrades, until the final boss where I used the health increase to beat X. Right off the bat, everything about the basic gameplay, graphics, music, running, jumping, shooting, slashing, it's all top notch. Where Zero trips down the stairs and breaks its own fucking back is in everything surrounding the gameplay. All the plot presentation, the side systems and gimmicks, which are all flawed in one way or another. Sweet, Reploid Jesus, you can't even attack in this game without grinding. Yeah, I get it's supposed to be amnesia, but as I said, I think Zero's amnesia is a bad plot point anyway. With that out of the way, we need to talk about lives one more time. I, I know I've been harping on it the entire playthrough, but it really is the biggest problem with the game. Specifically, the fact that they don't replenish after a game over. This is a hindrance for every reason I've broken down throughout the video, but it is unbelievable in the last stretch of Neo Arcadia, because unlike every other Mega Man game made at the time, the boss rush and the final boss are part of the same stage with no game over safe checkpoint between them. This means dying to the final boss sees you replaying the whole boss rush, the stage itself, and Copy X's two forms on whatever amount of lives you happen to have saved before you entered. This live system is not good. The devs knew it wasn't any good, so they changed it in every subsequent game. It's possible the lack of extra lives wouldn't be as much of a noob killer if you had some upgrades or energy tanks like every other Mega Man game since the second one. But if you want anything like that in Zero, you're gonna have to engage with the Cyber Elf menu. Surprising nobody, the entire Cyber Elf system is flawed and does not encourage exploration or experimentation. Since armor, sub tanks, and heart tanks have been removed, the only incentive to explore the levels in Mega Man Zero is the Cyber Elves, which is well and good, but considering a normal playthrough might net you enough crystals to use one of the legitimately useful elves by the end, it's not worthwhile to even bother searching them out. Unless you plan to hop on your skateboard Tony Hawk style and grind the day away, you're gonna have to pick one or two of the most important ones, aka any of the ones that give you more health, be that in the form of max HP or sub tanks. There are two other entire pages of Cyber Elves, and I don't have a single iota of a clue what any of them give you. Those last few minutes were pretty harsh, but the only reason I'm so bothered by it is how avoidable it all was, and how good the game underneath is. Everything wrong with Mega Man Zero is either a system limitation or an easily fixable numbers issue. But there's still a fun game in there beyond all those mistakes. As long as you're playing on the Legacy Collection to bypass the stingy life count and occasional level design fuckery, Mega Man Zero is still a pretty enjoyable game. And luckily, the community consensus seems to be that this first game is rough, but the sequels vastly improve upon it. 
I can't see myself making reviews for the other three Zero games. Not any time in the foreseeable future, anyway. I've got other stuff to do. If you're curious for quick opinions, I just finished Mega Man Zero 3 at the time of making this video, and almost 100% of my criticisms have been addressed and taken care of in the sequels. Especially Zero 3, which completely blows Zero 1 out of the water in every aspect. If this video does, like, uncharacteristically well for some reason, I might come back for full reviews of 0, 2, 3, and 4, but I don't want to disappoint anybody, so, like, don't, don't get your hopes up too high. Hey, this video's over an hour long. There's a lot more outside. You, you, you don't want to hear me talk anymore. Be honest with yourself. So, short end slate today. Thank you for watching the video as always, and being so patient. I know it's been, like, a month and a half, <laughs> two months since the last video. Oops. I think I need to be more realistic about my time frames and expectations for myself. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to do all of the YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, share with your friends, stuff like that. Thanks again for watching and have a great day. Bye bye guys.